I am privileged tonight or evening um, to be co-facilitating today's session along with the lovely Zara Raven. Before Zara introduces themselves, I am dropping a link to the resource that we will be discussing today, which is a zine that was co-authored, uh, so that was authored by Zara with contributions from others, and which was beautifully designed by um, Interrupting Criminalization's creative director, Eva Nagal. So just putting that into the chat. So if you haven't seen it, you can use it and look at it um, at your leisure. Now, please join me in welcoming Zara. Hello, um, thank you so much for grounding us in those values in that introduction, Miriam. Hi y'all, um, my name is Zara Raven. I use my name or Z in lieu of pronouns. Um, and I am the coordinator of Queenie's Crew, which has been a program of Project Nia that's working to educate um, children, six to 10 year old children about building communities of care without prisons or policing. Um, you can go ahead and move to the next slide, Erin. And I'm based in Philadelphia. I'm a longtime organizer. Um, a lot of my work is focused on interrupting state and inter inter uh, interpersonal violence. I'm also a parent and a caregiver. Um, and I'm so excited to see so many friends and Queenie's crew families um, in this space today. Um, we have, uh, yes, a very interactive schedule. And also just like Miriam said, I know that most, if not all of us are caregivers um, and might have interruptions, might uh, need to attend to some pressing need. Last time I was presenting on something, my little one needed to tell me that uh, Anna and Elsa from Frozen are cousins with Rapunzel from Tangled. And so I understand uh, and, and expect that there will be important information updates from the little people uh, in our lives. But this is our agenda for tonight. First, we're going to share more about Queenie's crew, who we are and what we do. Um, then we're going to talk about transforming the ways we relate to children, um, interrupting adultism, interrupting uh, adult supremacy. We'll take a short break. And then when we come back, Miriam is going to be reading us um, the book all by himself. So if little ones want to come over for a bedtime story, that will be a good time to do so. Um, and then finally, we'll be talking about building communities of care wherever you are. We'll invite you all to share about how you're building communities of care, challenges that have come up. Um, and we'll also go through the zine where I share some of the strategies and um, actions that I've taken to build a community of care in my community. So you can go on to the next slide. So yes, Queenie's Crew. Um, so I already shared that Queenie's Crew is a program of Project Nia engaging six to 10 year old children in learning to build communities of care without prisons or policing. It's named after Queenie, who is the protagonist of See You Soon, which is a children's book both by Miriam and illustrated by Bianca Diaz about a six year old who is separated from her mother by incarceration. Miriam, did you want to share more about the book and the origins of the program? Thank you so much, Sarah. Yes, I will jump in here um, and just say that I'll be very quick. Um, I wrote a children's book, um, as Sarah mentioned, called See You Soon, that was illustrated by my friend and collaborator, Bianca Diaz, um, as a follow-up to a book that I wrote called Missing Daddy. Um, See You Soon came about because I received messages from children after Missing Daddy came out, um, and uh, <laughs> they were basically asking me when there would be a missing mommy, um, so kind of when there would be a sequel to Missing Daddy, maybe that applied to their circumstances in their lives. And one particular persistent small person actually kept writing to me through her grandmother um, for months, actually, <laughs> to demand a sequel, um, a missing mommy. Um, and so See You Soon is the story of a little girl nicknamed Queenie, um, whose mom basically has to turn herself into jail for a relatively short term jail 
um, stint that would be uh, about two years short term for, you know, uh, general uh, kind of in, in the scheme of life, but very long term to the child. Um, and it addresses some of the emotions and experiences of children with incarcerated loved ones. The book is dedicated to my comrade and friend, Keely Shenoir, who passed away too soon um, and too young. As we approached the publication date of March of 2022, I was worried because the small people who had been my main editors and readers um, as I was working on the manuscript really, really, really wanted a happy ending and would communicate to me through their caregivers and sometimes directly uh, about the fact that there needed to be a happy ending. There need Queenie and mom needed to be at the end of the book reunited and it, like, Honestly, there was a lot, it was just so adamant, right? Um, and it was coming from many small people. Um, but you all know that we live, unfortunately, in uh, the real world. And unfortunately, situations don't always or even primarily resolve themselves so neatly. I wanted to offer a potential then so soft place to land for some of the kids who might read the book. Um, and also to maybe create more co-strugglers for all of the Queenies among their peers. So I reached out to Zara in late 2021 because I know them to be an excellent caregiver of a small person and someone who has been trying to apply an abolitionist politic and vision to that caretaking. I shared a couple of ideas and invited Zara to shape and create a container that could hold some of those ideas. But also I explained that the container could also be and should also be expanded to hold Zara's ideas and the participants as well. So that's just a little bit of background on kind of really brings you up to speed on how I came to write the book you know, what pushed that to happen in the first place. I had no intention of writing any other kind of book like this, um, like Missing Daddy. And um, then what my concerns were, were when the story was being critiqued by small people. And then, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out like, there's gotta be a constructive way to make something that will allow for, um, you know, um, solidarity and space and a way for people to continue to engage in conversation. So that's how Zara came into the, uh, you know, into the picture. And I want to say I was so, um, I'm so grateful to Zara for stepping up and stepping to the challenge of doing this because there are no templates and Zara's really had to, you know, be creative. And I'm just going to throw over to Zara to take you through Kind of the evolution of uh, Queenie's crew and um, how Zara has seen the work change, transform, and deepen. Thanks, Zara. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, I was so excited when Miriam reached out to me. I had already been homeschooling and unschooling and sort of trying to create makeshift activities at home to teach my little one about abolition. But it was also a time that I think many of us, if not all of us, were particularly isolated by the pandemic. Um, and so I think that's definitely been one of the big challenges of Queenie's Crew, that it is a virtual program. I think it's both a benefit and a challenge. On one hand, it's that um, folks in, you know, in communities where there might not be a lot of abolitionist organizing or a lot of abolitionist caregivers coming together had a space to connect with other caregivers with similar or shared values. And then also, I think doing kids programming online when kids had just spent so much time, especially little ones doing online school, I think was obviously really tough and, and made it difficult for kids to connect. But I think particularly in Philly, um, there we had a, a nice little crew of folks who became friends through the program and some folks who were friends before the program who were able to do the activities together. 
Um, and so today I wanted to share a little bit about some of the activities that we did with Queenie's crew. So we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, so these are a couple of the activities we did. Um, so we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of really fantastic activities that exist um, to support adults in thinking about how to apply abolitionist um, practices and logic to our everyday lives. Um, and so one of the things we did was seek those activities out and apply them, um, adapt them for children. So I love our pod mapping worksheet. The pod mapping worksheet, many of you are probably familiar with, um, was originally created by the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective and Bianca, um, who illustrated See You Soon, uh, helped to create all of the art for a lot of the activities that we did, if not all of the activities that we did. Um, we also adapted art from um, uh, adapted art from other artists like Micah Bazant and um, Rami Tallarico, Mara Razo. We worked with so many amazing artists, but the pod mapping worksheet, if you're not familiar with it, and thank you, Megan, um, in the chat, Megan said, it's so good, thank you. Um, so if you're not familiar with the pod mapping worksheet, um, basically the idea is that it's similar to a phone tree, um, and it encourages us to sit down and really think about who in our community we call when we experience harm, um, to support us and what are the ways that we want to be supported, uh, it also encourages us to think about what are the resources that exist in our community to support us through those experiences. And um, it also encourages us to think about who we turn to when we cause harm, who in our communities keeps us accountable to our values. So that's the pod mapping worksheet. Um, we also have an image here of a Mother's Day card that Mia sent um, and shared on our Padlet. So for Mother's Day last year, we sent um, Mother's Day cards to incarcerated mamas. Um, we worked with an organization in Chicago um, to identify some moms that we could send mail to. And then we can go to the next slide. One of my favorite activities um, was this transforming conflict worksheet where we actually pulled the art directly from the book, See You Soon, um, of an incident where Queenie is being bullied. And, um, you know, when harm happens, carceral logics and systems of punishment ask us, you know, who's to blame, who will be punished. And abolition invites us to ask a different set of questions. So um, abolitionist thinking invites us to think about the needs. What do we need when we experience harm? What do we need to feel safe? And so this activity um, invited kids to think about a conflict or an experience of harm that they've had, what was said to them. So Coco shared, you're bad at jumping rope was said to them. And um, when they feel hurt, what they need is a friend. And so at the end, you see Coco and a friend being supported. So at this very early age, we're able to support kids in thinking about, um, yeah, what are their needs? What are their feelings? Um, and how can we create safety um, without punishment? And we can move to the next slide. This one I loved so much. So we had a zine making for conflict transformation workshop in May that I think some of you attended. Um, and we um, we worked with Mara Razo, who created the cover art for the zine and also our website, and is also just a long-term friend of mine who taught me how to make zines. Um, and this zine was created by Araceli, who's the seven-year-old here in Philly. And I just want to invite you all to listen to the One Million Experiments podcast. Um, at the very end, you can listen to Araceli, uh, of the very end of the most recent episode, um, you can listen to Araceli sharing about her zine where she talks about a conflict with her mother and um, 
reflecting on just her experience of the conflict, what she can be accountable for within the conflict. Um, and, and yes, so we did a lot of really fantastic and exciting work supporting kids and thinking about how to transform conflicts. And thank you, Jonathan, in the chat, Jonathan says, it's a great episode. And Christine, ask what is the podcast? So the podcast is 1 Million Experiments and thank you, Eva, for sharing the link. Okay, we can go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so to get us started, um, I wanted to encourage us to think about, to transform, think about how we're going to transform the ways that we relate to children. And throughout the zine, um, so the zine is divided into three parts. The first part is um, how we work on the uh, individual level to um, interrupt adult supremacy, to build communities of care. The second part is on the community level, how are we building communities of care? And the third part is um, how are we working on the systemic level? And for that piece, uh, we won't go over it today because we had an event on it about a month ago. Aaron Miles Cloud shares, uh, and Aaron is the director, and I know you're here in the room, of uh, Movement for Family Power, which is working to end family policing. And so um, Aaron shares about how she talks to her children, has talked to her children about the family policing system. So this part is, yeah, how do we, how do we think on the individual level how we, about how we can transform the ways we relate to children. And I included this quote by Black Panther Sophia Bukhari um, from the book, The War Before, where she writes, our children are not our property. Our children are little people who have been placed in our care for us to nurture and guide. And Erin, you can move to the next slide. I wanted to pose a set of questions for all of you um, about how children are treated in your community. So um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the four eyes of oppression. I actually don't know who created this model, but I learned about it from my friend, Dirakshan Raja, who's also the director of an organization called Muslims for Just Futures, um, and just a friend who's taught me so much. And, the idea is that oppression happens and is upheld and reinforced at these four levels, ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and it's internalized. Um, and so, and S. Sheridan asked, uh, so these slides are so, in the chat, these slides are so amazing. Apologize, apologies if I missed this mention at the beginning. I joined a few moment, moments late. Will these slides be shared? Yes, the slides will be shared and the videos will be shared. Thank you. So um, I wanted to offer some of these guiding questions um, and also to encourage you all to reflect on this for a few minutes and then share your responses. You don't have to answer all of the questions, but they're offered to help you start thinking about how children are treated in your community. So um, first on the ideological level, what are the dominant beliefs about kids and about how kids should be treated? On the institutional level, what are some of the policies and systems that impact kids and the ways the kids are treated? On the interpersonal level, what have you heard people say about kids? And how do you witness people treating kids? And finally, um, on the internal, internal level, um, what are your conscious beliefs about children? And how does your behavior reflect or not reflect those beliefs? And in the chat, Megan also asked, who did create this model? I've been wondering for decades. The closest I've come is a similar model from Dr. Camera Jones. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, I really don't know. I was looking to cite them, um, but thank you for offering Dr. Camera Jones's name. 
And Riley said, I've always seen global action project cited for the four eyes. Not sure if that's correct. Thank you. I appreciate that this is a collective collective effort to figure out how to cite these folks. Um, so I'm going to give folks two minutes to just think about some of these questions. And if you're someone who likes to journal, I certainly am. Um, you can journal and then in two minutes, I'm going to invite you to share. Does that feel like enough time? You don't have to answer every question. I would invite folks as you're thinking, if you can drop in the chat, some of your thoughts, that would be great. I'm sorry, I'll be reading from the chat as the chat stuff comes in. Yes, thank you, Miriam. So right off the bat, Miriam shared on the ideological level, the idea that children should be seen and not heard. That I hear consistently, I mean, even just like on the interpersonal level, but that it's a definitely um, a big part of what upholds adultism. And also on the interpersonal level, Miriam shared in the chat, child abuse, children being harmed physically and mentally. Jonathan shared, when my kid was younger, we talked a lot about how the world was designed in some specific ways that are hard for a very sensitive person, especially when also dealing with patriarchy and how it affected the masculine folks around her. Thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. And I think it also speaks to um, how these systems are interconnected, um, how adultism works in concert with patriarchy, with ableism. NL shared on the ideological level, the idea of uh, respecting elders slash parents in quotes means following rules without being able to challenge those rules or ask for accommodations. Yes, absolutely. So respect meaning obedience rather than respect meaning attending to different needs, for example. Rebecca shared that they don't understand the world and need to be sheltered. Chelsea shared that their opinions don't matter. They don't have autonomy. Riley shared, I've been working with teachers and counselors and keep seeing these limits. Like children are not capable of thinking critically or understanding complexity. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, we have so many amazing responses in the chat. Thank you all. Um, let's see, Melanie, ideological, we can sculpt kids to be exactly how we want them to be. Yes. Sarah shared, I, ideological, children need to respect their elders, but not the reverse. Yes, so similar to what was shared above, that kids are expected to be obedient, but respect in this context for some reason doesn't go both ways. Um, ideological, children aren't ready to have difficult conversations or be introduced to quote unquote sensitive topics like racism, LGBTQIA plus issues, police brutality, et cetera. Thank you for sharing that, Nikki. I don't think I, I read your name, um, but yes, I mean, that's what's, um, 
informing a lot of the uh, bans on Black history being taught in schools, on um, people being able to share their pronouns or play with gender. Um, actually, here in Philly, we are having four days of actions um, to respond to the group Moms for Liberty it is hosting a conference at the Marriott. And so organizations like ACT UP and the Philly Children's Mute Movement and the Philly Child Care Collective, which I'm a part of, are all organizing actions to respond and to reject that line of thinking. Um, okay, let's see. I don't know where I was. Oh, S shared and shared on the institutional level. Kids are under the control of parents until 18. Control, control, control. And even after 18, respect, obey. Uh, respect means obey your parents. Nuclear family embedded into all government systems, health insurance plans and housing plans. Amanda shared, I work as a school social worker and students are the last to be consulted with when it comes to policies and practices that directly impact them. Um, I'm going to start skipping around because you all have so many great responses. Uh, Madeline shared on the interpersonal level, if you want a kid to move, you can just pick them up without their consent and move them. You can just talk about kids negatively in front of them because, quote unquote, they don't know any better. Mm. I'd be curious about um, whether anyone um, would like to share about how, about your conscious beliefs about children and how your behavior reflects those beliefs or doesn't. Oh, and Megan, you're going to be in, in the chat. Uh, Megan said, I'll be in Philly this Sunday if there's anything I can do to support. Um, yes, there is a week of actions. I can share during the break um, one of the graphics. So yes, I'm sure there, I, I think we have actions on Sunday too. Um, let's see. One dominant ideological belief is that, uh, Carla shared, one dominant ideological belief is that adults are solely responsible for protecting children rather that, than that both adults and children are responsible for protecting both adults and other children. Beautifully put, thank you. Okay, Mari shared internalized. I believe I have a lot to learn from children and what it means to be present with ourselves and be in trust our with, with our body's wisdom. I try to be intentional about being present with their curiosity and listening to their embodied and communicated needs and affirming these things in them and in me. Thank you for sharing that. Michelle shared, my kid deaf keeps in line when I want to share about him to my sister or friends. He tells me, mom, don't talk about me. Ooh, I love when they stand up for themselves. Um, it's so inspiring to me whenever I hear my child setting a boundary with someone. That's definitely something I still struggle with just because of the way I've been socialized and impacted in the world. Um, and so, you know, listening to kids feeling confident enough um, to stand up for themselves is, it just always excites me. And thank you for sharing that. Um, Christine shared, my daughter is a new library assistant in free, a free library in Philly and definitely wants to connect to help in your work. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Um, I would love to connect, thank you. Let's see, um, Megan shared, internalized, I sometimes find myself being frustrated with my inner child and struggle to share the big feelings that my younger self has around other adults, internalized shame. Thank you so much for sharing that too. I think so much of, for me, 
my work in transforming the ways that I relate to children has been and has involved reparenting my inner child. Um, if something frustrates me, like my child dropping things, then I have to pause and say, okay, why is that frustrating to me? And I think about how was I treated when I made a mistake? How was I treated when I dropped things? Because I was and am a very clumsy person. <laughs> um, and so a lot of learning to relate in a different way is learning to give myself grace too. Um, Jonathan shared, I think consciously, I believe children deserve a lot more patience than I necessarily offer, especially when we run up against things like getting ready to go to bed or getting ready to go somewhere. I really relate to that too, Jonathan. Um, learning to move at the pace of wellness when the world doesn't, right? Like the school starts at a certain time and like, how do we, how do we practice our values while living in this world? Madeline shared internalized. Definitely, I am still unlearning internalized beliefs about respect, but I'm consciously trying to recognize and praise autonomy and feedback from kids. Keeping myself accountable mostly looks like listening to my inner child too. Asking the me inside myself how I would want to be treated. Yes, um, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing, Madeline. Thank you all so much for um, sharing those reflections and those thoughts. Um, I know that, let's see. Yeah, I think, I think we're making good time actually. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Let's see. And here I just wanted to share a few resources for rethinking your relationship with kids. These are some resources that I really loved that I included in the zine. I think there are one or two more in the zine um, on this topic. So the book all about love um, and especially the, the chapter Justice, Childhood Love Lessons. Um, the book Revolutionary Mothering, Love on the Front Lines. This is something I just finished reading. It's edited by Alexis Pauline Gums, Maya Williams, and China Martens. I started reading this book initially many years ago, and what I was looking for was like a how-to. I was like, no, I want to revolutionarily mother <laughs> and realize that that's not what it was. And so now having had a few years of practice under my belt, it was really a beautiful read. Um, and I felt really seen, affirmed, and held by this book. The next one is The Politics of Childhood by Aurora Morales Levins from Medicine Stories. And the last one I have on here is Trust Kids, Stories on Youth Autonomy and Confronting Adult Supremacy, ed edited by Carla Joy Bergman. So those are just a few resources, um, but just based on all of your, everything folks have shared already in the chat today, I'd be curious about what additional resources have informed some of your beliefs and um, how you've come to learn to um, respect youth autonomy and interrupt adult supremacy. What are the resources you all like? And I'm going to invite you all to share again in the chat. Um, and in a few minutes, we're going to take a break. Troublemakers by Carla Shalaby. I'm sorry if I, I'm sorry, in the chat, um, Riley said Troublemakers by Carla Shalaby. And I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. And I know Carla's in the room. That's a book on my to read list. Um, Safra shared, I honor my child having emotional intelligence and capacity to hold things. I talk to them about my emotions and I'm transparent, including with a family tragedy recently. I'll also add, I do think it's a balance, balancing act to make sure their capacity to hold and their feelings are being super tended to. Um, and Safra shared, I tried to share this earlier, but accidentally was sent as a DM. Oh, okay, no problem. Thank you so much for sharing. And yeah, I encourage you all to just keep reflecting on those questions. I really appreciate all of your responses. Um, back to resources, Megan shared anti-bias education for young children and ourselves. And Ana Maria shared- I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can you read just a little bit slower, especially when you get to names that I need to spell out? Thank you. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you, Kat, for reminding me to slow down. Um, 
So Ana Maria shared, I would not be the parent I have become if it weren't for Akila S. Richards' book, Raising Free People. Yes, I read that book too, I think last year, and I loved it so much. Um, Nikki shared, I'm a mother of teens. They teach me a lot. When I share with them, it's usually adult oriented material that I just sort of soften or edit for them. Mm -hmm. I'd love to learn more about more resources for adolescents. Mothering never really ends. Oh, thank you for sharing that, Nikki. Um, I, yeah, I'm a parent of a 10 year old. And so I feel like every year I am looking for a new set of resources to prepare for the next phase. Um, but I, I do hope that other folks in the chat share um, ideas and resources. Carla shared haircuts by children and other evidence for a new social contract. I'm also realizing it is 7.20 p.m. and so it is actually time for our break. But we do have a lot of resources in the zine, um, additional resources, and I encourage you all to keep sharing in the chat. Safra asked, any way we can get a list of these resources or should I start making quick notes? I know I will be writing them down. Um, and I think that we can include them when we send out the, um, the video for this session. So thank you for making that ask, but it won't hurt to, to make your own list um, just in case anything gets missed. So, I'm gonna share um, a book. It's new. Um, I think it just came out. It might have just come out this year. I love it um, really a lot. And I thought I would share it with you because I love story time. So we're gonna do that. And then I'm gonna ask a few questions and then we're gonna keep it moving. Um, so let me see here. I'm going to put into the chat just so you have it, if you want to, the slides, um, so you can look at the slides if you want to um, in your, you know, on your mobile or whatever, but we'll also be doing it on the screen and I will be reading out loud. So the book is called All By Himself, written by Elena K. Arnold, illustrated by Giselle Potter. Next page, please. Because years ago, before the child was even born, a farmer planted a seedling. And because after that, an arborist tended the tree that grew from the seedling the farmer had planted. And because last fall, a woodcutter felled the tree that the arborist tended, that grew from the seedling the farmer had planted. And because last spring, a woodcutter carved blocks from wood that came from the tree that the woodcutter felled, that the arborist tended, that grew from the seedling the farmer had planted. And because last summer, an artist painted the blocks that the woodcutter carved from the wood of the tree that the woodcutter felled, that the arborist tended, that grew from the seedling that the farmer had planted. And because last month, a driver transported the blocks that the artist painted, that the woodworker worker carved from the wood of the tree that the woodcutter felled, that the arborist tended, that grew from a seedling the farmer had planted. And because last week, a shopkeep displayed the blocks that the driver transported, that the artist painted, that the woodworker carved from the wood of the tree, that the woodcutter felled, that the arborist tended, that grew from a seedling the farmer had planted. And because yesterday, the grandmother went to the shop to buy the blocks that the shopkeep displayed, that the driver transported, that the artist painted, 
that the wood cut, woodworker carved from the wood of the tree, that the woodcutter felled, that the arborist tended, that grew from a seedling the farmer had planted. Because of all of this, today, the child built a masterpiece all by himself. And also, next slide, thank you. With the grandmother and the shopkeep and the driver and the artist and the woodworker and the woodcutter and the arborist and the farmer and of course the tree itself the end <laughs> so um I really just love everything about this book. I hope you find something um, useful and beautiful in it too. And I just thought I'd put just a question in the chat for you, if you might just take a moment to think about and respond. And the question is, how might this story embody or reflect an abolitionist vision of society? I'm gonna give you some time to think of a response. How might this story embody or reflect an abolitionist vision of society? Can you just put it in the chat, your thoughts? Feel free to take away whatever you think. You're welcome, Riley and Sheridan. Yeah, Megan, different members of the community are each doing their part, working together, acknowledging each person's contribution. We are all needed. That people in communities rely on each other, an acknowledgement of interconnectedness. Yes, thank you, Julia. It emphasizes interconnectedness None of us are free until all of us are free. Thank you. Jonathan says, it has a beautiful image of doing things together and realizing interdependence in a way that kids could, uh, so in a way kids could easily think easily about. Thank you. Lauren, we all have our role. We're all connected. We're all needed. I love it. Anne Marie, there are no institutions involved, police, corporation, government, et cetera. Thank you for that, Anne Marie. Sarah, it takes a long time to build something good. Yep. Madeline, everything is collective when we zoom out, but there is still room for individual accomplishments. I love that. Michelle, that we are working together and connected and it's a process and it takes time. Absolutely. Queen Cheyenne, that we all have something to bring to our communities. <clears throat> Absolutely. <throat> Megan, interconnectedness with the natural world beyond humans. Isn't that so important? Julia also shows that Big special things are built from many small actions by many different people. Thank you. Liz, we are all connected to one another and to the earth. Yes, Abby, <laughs> nothing we do that's worthwhile is done alone. So much so. I really, to me, this book is everything that my father taught me um, about life and living well. So I love it for that reason too. Leticia has all of the activities and actions or works that require love 
and are not based on commodity or ownership. Wow, this is, that's so real. I hadn't even gone there. I love that. Melanie, as a newer mom that often feels alone and without a village, this book gives me so much hope. First of all, congratulations. Second of all, there is a village, always. We sometimes just have to make ours and that can be exhausting, but it's so worthwhile. Anna Maria, that everyone's part is as important as everyone else's. We're each, so we are each of us integral to the whole. I love it. Let me just read a couple of last ones. Christine Lively, people use their skills and doing what they love to contribute to something that they might not even envision as they do their work. And they pass it along to the next person who changes and alters the tree until the work and the community doesn't have a start or end. I love that. And also note Elena K. Arnold, the second most banned author in the United States. Her books are incredible. Autumn, an expression of community usually involves the mycelial, an interwoven, interconnected way to see the world that stems from the earth and binds us all together in our actions and efforts. Beautiful. So I'm really so grateful to all of you for really listening and for engaging this book, which really, I think children of almost any age will understand, but so should adults read this book because we are living in a country where we are having a fundamental disagreement, and this has been ongoing as part of the conservative project in this country, which is to erode the notion that we live in a society, right? Leftists, for the most part, believe we live in a society and people on the right often do not. And those are competing and contested fights, like real ideological and also material fights. And this book says, no, we live in a society actually, and shows us how. So for me, children's literature can and often does open up ways to talk with small people and with grown folks about abolition. The zine shares some examples of children's books that can be used to foster conversations about PIC abolition. If you start on page 25 of the zine, um, I offer a set of questions to think about. Keep the following questions in mind, I say, as you read children's books to assess whether they can be used to support abolitionist inquiry and, and discussions. And I'm just gonna put in the chat what those four questions are that I think could be helpful guides as you are assessing the material. The questions are, how is harm defined in the world described in the book? Who responds and how? What are the consequences imposed for harm? Who implements and enforces those consequences? So these questions, I think, when you're using them as an assessment, as you're reading these texts, will offer a way to evaluate whether particular texts can be applied to developing an abolitionist vision in politics. So for me, again, it is so critically important for us to have these conversations with small people in multiple kinds of ways. And reading together is a great way to be able to have conversations, as you all know, with small people, um, to engage them, to listen to the questions they ask, to be able to slow down a little bit and hear how they connect with the work and the words and the ideas. Um, and so I really hope that people use children's books in a broader, more kind of you know intentional way. And when you think, for me at least, an absolutely fundamental lesson of abolition for me, for PIC abolition for me, was to consistently remind me of our interdependence to really say for real that um, nobody is free unless all of us is free. 
And that means something real. That means that the only way we're going to quote unquote create safety is together. The only way we're going to create anything meaningful is together. The reality of the fact is that PAC abolition says, no, no, we live in a society. We owe each other something. There is no such thing as saying, we don't owe anybody things. Of course you owe people things. You exist only in this world because other people exist too. And because the people who came before you existed and those who came before you, them existed. And you are now gonna be an ancestor to the people who come next because you existed, they will exist too. And that is a fundamental, fundamental point of PIC abolition. If you don't leave with any other thing, I always tell people when we talk about abolition, we center the prison, we center policing, we center surveillance, not just because they're death-making institutions, but because at the center of each of them, the logics that they promote, that death-making punitive logic is a logic that thrives on the breaking of relationship, the breaking of connection, the alienation from each other, right? That that is what we are centering. And that all that, all those things together have ripple effects in every other aspect of our society, right? So I hope that you might find in the in the um in the uh, zine a lot of other books that you can use that you can think about. It's an ongoing project of mine that I've been working on for a few years, and um, I hope to add to it over time. Um, so I'm going to throw back to Zara. Take us to the next part. Thank you so much, Miriam, for sharing that um, that story with us and and just continuing to ground us in uh, the values of interdependence and collective liberation. I have learned so much. I'm sure all of you have too, from Miriam over the years. Um, I so we can jump back into the slides. Thank you, um, Aaron. So the last section of our discussion today is focusing on how to build a care team. Um, and that is the focus of a lot of the zine. And so the zine will take you through, um, I think six or seven steps that I offer. Um, but I also want to name that, you know, there is no one size fits all approach. The steps and the suggestions that I offer in the zine are actions that I have taken to build a community of care in the place where I live. Um, and this discussion is meant to invite you all to reflect on what actions you're already taking to build a community of care where you live um, and to talk through some of the challenges that have come up for you. And um, yeah, um, yeah, how we build these villages. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, first, I wanted to share a couple of the stories to get you all thinking about what, um, what actions you take. So we have a couple of stories in the zine of folks that um, we know as a team that put together the zine, um, who are building a community of care, who are acting as part of the, a village. Many of these folks, I think all of these folks, aren't people who um, are raising children themselves, but are raising children just by virtue of being part of uh, villages. So Queen is the first person. Queen learned about the importance of youth work through their mother. Katrina was an organizer, if there ever was one starting childcare collectives and after school programs in our public housing community. Katrina hosted community dinners, family game nights, offering a supportive space for young mothers and youth in our home. To this day, young people and parents tell me about how my mother impacted their life and supported their family's growth. I see my work as a continuation of my mother's lineage. I prioritize care of youth and families by building spaces for restorative and transformative justice, youth learning, community resource building, and mutual aid. In a country that continues to increase how Black youth and families are criminalized and separated from their roots, 
I work to envision a world where all Black youth and families can address and create their own solutions, just as Katrina did. And Queen is actually here in Philly, um, going to be organizing a series to teach young people, teens, about restorative justice. Um, the next story is Robin on the next slide. Thank you, Erin. And Robin Hernandez brings her passion for growing food and food systems to the small people in her life. When it comes to showing up for kids in my community, I offer love, garden, and food experiences, safety, and a listening body. In classrooms, as a food educator, I humble myself and acknowledge that knowledge is a journey and it looks different for everyone. Receiving and accepting feedback from kids and in classrooms centering their voices, their knowledge, their experiences, respecting kids' goals and desires, their boundaries and choices. I show up as my full self with kids because they are people with value and great importance. I feel very fortunate I'm able to work and learn with and from kids. So I see in Robin's story a lot of what many of you shared earlier. How do we um, how do we keep learning from kids too, and and remembering that kids are also powerful and have knowledge and wisdom to share with us. Um, Safira, Safira, thank you for the pronunciation in the chat said, what a mother, what an organizer about Queen and Katrina, I agree. And Tiffany Wang said, plugging the 1 million experiments newsletter as well. The latest edition shared the zine and podcast. And Riley asked, thank you. Are there newsletters sent regularly for Queenie's crew? And yes, there are. Um, we send out our newsletter every month, usually around the first. This next one will probably be a little bit later. Um, and we'll be sending newsletters out up until December of this year um, when Project Nia sunsets. But I want to hand the floor back to Miriam for a minute, too, to share um, can you share with us how you work to build a community of care in your community? Sure. Thank you, Zara. Um, yes, I am. I'm a big fan and cheerleader for small people. I, I really, they're my favorites. I like them more than adults. It's always people know this about me. Um, and there are many ways that I, uh, I was just, I was ref, um, reflecting, I think it was on social maybe, but I don't know, um, a couple of weeks ago that my neighbor who is a uh, new immigrant to the country, um, who does speaks no English, hardly any English, um, but her children are in school and her children speak English. You all know this experience of immigration when uh, the parent uh, maybe doesn't speak the language, but the children are the ones doing the translation um, for the family. Um, but they, uh, she sent her oldest next door to my house um, and knocked on my door. Oldest is 10. Um, and um, he asked me if I could come to school with them, um, then it was like a Thursday that they came by or something, or maybe a Friday, if I could come to school with them the next week, because there was an issue that had had arisen, and the mom did not know how to navigate it and did not have anybody to support her because her husband um, it mostly travels for work constantly. Um, he drives a truck, so he's away from home all the time, and he wasn't going to be around that week but this was an urgent um, issue. And what it just brought to me was, first of all, I was so glad that she reached out to, to me um, for help. You know, I've been taking her children from time to time when I'm around on weekends to various things like museum night, you know, museum uh, programs, art programs, or uh, we've gone to uh, movie night at the at the local parks department together. Um, we've, you know, done cool things where I, where I give her a break. She's got four children, all like within a couple of years of each other. So I take the older ones sometimes on weekends to just give a breather. And I just want to say that like that should be normal behavior. I I don't understand like 
whether or not you have kids yourself, I, d- I don't have biological children, but I have a ton of nibblings, a ton of God kids and a ton of other children in my life who are just in my neighborhood and community and who understand that I'm a person. If they need me for anything, they can come and have a conversation and we can talk or they can ask me for something. And if it's within my power that I will be able to help them, that I should do so. But that's that's built over time. That's trust that you build and earn. And um, yeah, so for me, it's just so critical to uh, just make yourself a person who can be called on in your community for whatever is happening around there. And I did go with the family to the school and sure enough, it was an issue that was uh, uh, with one of the kids. um, And I was able to intervene, talk, share with them and say that I would talk with their father when their father came back and um, having a conversation so that they can all be, you know, talking together about what this was about. And, um, and then, uh, you know, did not trust 100% that the kids were going to translate perfectly to the mother what was going on. So the big issue is to make sure that there might be an old, another adult that you can enlist in that case. That isn't just the kids, because I cannot speak Arabic. Um, so I don't know what the kid was telling the mom. And I didn't look like they were translating perfectly because when you're 10, you try to get over. Um, so anyway, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. I just think it's so important. You got to have a door. My door is open. My door is open. Everybody knows it in our neighborhood. Yeah. I love that story. Thank you so much for sharing, Miriam. Um, Also to shout out, Miriam, as soon as the pandemic hit, uh, I got a care package in the mail with kids books and stickers. So Miriam is just always showing up for little ones besides building organizations dedicated to um, youth learning. So just more shout outs and praise for MK. I would love to hear, actually, we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, from all of you about what actions you're already taking to build communities of care that are intergenerational. And we actually have a jam board. So Aaron, if you click the link, and then I'll also share the jam board in chat. Um, if folks are not familiar with jam board, it's a way for folks to share um, on little post-it notes so that we have a beautiful visual um, that you all then can hold on to and keep looking back at. Let's see, so here is the link to the Jamboard. And you can click on that little, if you see on the left side, there is a little notepad You can click on the notepad. Yes, the sticky note, that's what it is. And you can write your um, your thoughts there and add them to the Jamboard so we can all see what actions you're taking to build intergenerational communities of care. Little the sticky note. There we go. I see in the chat, Rebecca shared, I love Mia Birdsong's book, How We Show Up, and the chapter on childcare sharing. Oh, that sounds so wonderful. That book is on my to-read list too. And now I will definitely have to make sure I get it um, 
And so let's see the jam board. Okay, so many great um, actions folks are taking already. Sharing food with neighbors, pizza night for neighbor kids, mentoring. I organize mutual aid projects with survivors of IPV. Intergenerational, all ages library programs, mask banking with all types of sizes and shapes to fit all faces. Connecting families to one another. Welcoming kids in our building's garden and standing up for their right to use common spaces too. We're already running out of space on the jam board. I love it. Um, participating in mutual aid as a family, giving drawings to neighbors, small everyday moments to build that trust. I love that so much. And I saw in the chat a comment that said, um, Sapphira said, uh, personally, I feel a little stunted by the concept of trust. It's challenging. It's scary. Um, and, and we have to communicate with folks. You know, I actually, my child was over at a friend's house for a lot of the day yesterday while I was in meetings because they're not in camp yet. And so we had to have conversations that I'd forgotten um, are important to have, but I was glad the other parent brought it up. Like, do you have guns in the home? Um, so building trust, it takes time. I see I have conversations with people in the grocery store, connecting families to one another, taking care of each other's gardens, give clothes and food away in buy nothing group, yeah? I see Melanie in the chat said, I'm curious how folks with little ones engage in mutual aid. Mine is 17 months old. And I invite other folks to share. I will share that for me at that stage with my little one, a lot of it was clothing sharing or when, you know, we had a, in my neighborhood, my old neighborhood, we had a Facebook group for parents so that if you, your child has outgrown their clothes or you're no longer using some set of toys that we could just keep passing them around. Meal trains is the great one, diaper and clothes giveaways, uh, help and helping find formula for folks dealing with the shortage, awesome. These are so many great ideas. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I encourage you to keep looking at the Jamboard and reading each other's ideas and actions you're taking. I am going to, I'll read a couple more and then we're gonna move on to the next slide where I invite you to share about challenges. So let's see. Um, I've been working to create more spaces for youth and elders. Uh-oh, sorry, it's the it's a slide on the Jamboard. So we can go back to the Jamboard. Yes. So we'll, I'll read a couple more and then we can go to the next one. Um, sharing resources with other homeschooling parents. Tomorrow, the parenting co-op I'm in is hosting a free store and free yard sale for the community. Um, let's see. Always acknowledge the kids in my neighborhood, engage in real conversations with them, and let them come over and hang uh, to hang out with the chickens. Oh, I love that. These are beautiful. Recording stories with elderly neighbors. Thank you to whoever shared that one. Um, yeah, intergenerational means really all ages. And so listening to and documenting the stories of our elders is a beautiful way to build those communities. Okay, we can go ahead to the next slide of the Jamboard. And I'm curious about 
the challenges that you face in building communities of care. Yeah. So I'm seeing when kids just want to stay home, stay inside, I really relate to that. Um, especially um, when the pandemic began, I felt like there was a big shift where we used to go outside every single day. Um, and now I think we just got so used to staying inside that it's hard to yeah, I encourage my little one to want to go out. <laughs> mm, social anxiety, trust and building. Yes, desire for in-person connection while feeling social anxiety. My kids having trouble relating to families who rely on punishment and policing. Yes, that's a big one. We don't all share um, the same values. And so finding folks who um, share our values, I see that over here too. Survivor communities are still largely pro-policing. Mm -hmm. um, daily exhaustion and low capacity and burnout and capitalism. Yes, yes, and yes, we're tired, especially those of us who are already parenting um, and working finding time to also, and, and energy to also um, provide additional care can be really hard. Compassion fatigue and perfectionism or not opening the door when a neighbor knocks because I'm in pajamas, yeah. <laughs> I work a low paying full-time day job and solo parent and provide peer support. I'm under-resourced, but the demand for leadership and help just keeps coming. Yes, yes, these are the realities that we're living within. Um, we wanna build these communities and we're tired. We're often parenting alone. This is why I'm actually really appreciative that there are a lot of folks who are not parents um, engaging in this space today, because I think, especially parents, solo parents, um, we need more allyship. So let's see, difficulties finding people who are on the same page regarding COVID consciousness. Yes, yes, and yes. Thank you for that. So exhaustion with having a baby, yes. Family of origin has different values, yet my child loves her cousins. So navigating those relationships when, yeah, again, shared the shared values might not be there. Thank you all so much for sharing both the actions you're taking and um, the and the challenges that you're facing. Um, these are, are very real. And, you know, we don't have easy solutions. Um, like I said before, there's no like, okay, these are seven steps and then you'll have a village. No, I've always wanted a village. Um, I haven't always had one. Let's see. Ana Maria said, all of these post-its on the second slide are so relatable. I really appreciate everyone that shared. Agreed. I'm going to read a couple of more and then 
Let's, we'll go back into the presentation and then we'll close pretty soon, or well, we create space for Q&A pretty soon. Um, we definitely wanna hear your questions and wanna give folks time to get questions answered or to be able to make connections in the chat. And we do know it's late. So we are, the, our talking is ending soon in about 10 minutes at most. Yeah. Um, folks need to jump off. We understand eight o'clock is usually people's tolerance. You're working, you've got a lot <laughs> going on. So just to let you know that it's okay if you need to drop off and we will have uh, about 15 minutes available for questions or resource sharing. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, so we've got balancing the needs of family and community. Yep. Fear of professional and police retaliation. Mm. Dynamics among kids can spill over to tension among adult caregivers too. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I have a, a little one. I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't um, turned into tension among the adults yet, but, or <laughs> hope not ever, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, a little one who sleeps over um, regularly and the kids sometimes are just in conflict. How do you keep showing up and also honor kids' feelings and needs about um, conflicts with other kids? Yeah, thank you all again so much for sharing. We're gonna go back into the slide deck. Um, and I'm gonna just share a little bit about some of the actions that I've been taking that you can also read about in the zine. Um, so the first step that I named or first action step that I named for building a community of care is explore what already exists. You don't always have to create things or invent things. Um, I had been, I've been in Philly for almost a year now, and I was talking with a friend for a long time about building a childcare collective. We were like, how is there no child care collective in Philly? And so then when I started to do the research, it turned out there had has been a child care collective in Philly for a long time. And so um, I ended up finding that they were on hiatus. I sent an email um, and just said, hey, if you're waiting for folks who have the capacity, who've been involved in child care collectives in the past, uh, help get things going again um, here. <laughs> um, and so we joined the Child Care Collective and helped to restart it. But I'd invite you to consider whether there might be a local child care collective where you are, um, where you can volunteer your time, or are there parents and or young people in your community already organizing towards some specific goal like preserving housing? Um, I'm thinking of the people's townhomes here in Philly um, or Moms for Housing in Oakland, California. Um, so you can join existing efforts um, and it's all, lending your time and resources to existing projects can be a powerful way to build community, to learn and to contribute. Um, and in the chat, Jonathan shared, we had a collective in the Twin Cities, but I think it also went on hiatus. Good idea to check on it again. Yeah. Um, I know in the zine, we listed some of the child care collectives. There's one in Detroit, Chicago. I used to be part of the DC child care collective. And I was also part of the New York child care collective, the Generacion. Um, but yeah, there might be a child care collective in your community um, waiting for volunteers. Okay, we can move to the next slide. Um, reflect on your positioning. So um, this is an identity wheel, some um, identities that you can, that I invite you to consider um, because the what identities we hold and the ways that we differently experience intersecting layers of oppression can influence the ways that it's appropriate to engage. Um, so I included this article in here um, called Beyond Making a Statement and Intersectional Framing of the Power and Possibilities of Positioning by Mildred Boveda and Scubini Ansi Anama. Um, it's a new article that I recently read and really appreciated because it talked about positioning as a dynamic thing. It's not static. Our, our positioning changes um, and 
is different depending on a lot of different um, factors. So reflecting on your positioning, the next slide is meet your neighbor. So this is my little one. Um, one of the ways that we are working to both care for the land and also meet our neighbors is there's a plot of land next door to my house that was just covered in trash. This is sort of a in the middle. This was like March. We had a warm day and we were able to be out there cleaning, but um, we're building a community garden and doing that, that process has meant that um, we're outside a lot and I've been able to meet my neighbors throughout that process because just spending an extended period of time outside, you're gonna see people who um, you might not see often if folks are just, you know, usually just leaving for work and coming back home from work. Um, so it's been a really beautiful way to meet our neighbors. But we've also met neighbors through folks knocking on my door and saying, oh, my child just outgrew all these clothes. Um, and that's right now my, my kid's favorite bag of clothing. So um, I think similar to what Miriam was saying, just always having an open door. Next slide is engage in learning and uh, in unlearning and relearning. And so in the zine, we have a lot of resources, both for kids and for adults on some of these topics and a few more. So disability justice, reproductive justice, transformative justice. Um, I don't claim that the zine is comprehensive and covers every value that's important uh, for building a community of care. So keep reflecting on what other values are important um, to you and, and how you're learning and then also how you're embodying those values. Um, that's been an important process for me over the past few years, um, not just learning things cerebrally through like the right side of my brain, but how am I integrating it? Something I do is um, I will just journal and I'll think about like, okay, where did my beliefs about disability and care work come from? And how did this those ideas inform and intersect with what I was taught about race, class, gender, and other oppressions? And I'll try to um, create a genealogy, like what what happened? What were my actual lived experiences and how is it lining up with what I believe and what I practice now? And we can go on to the next slide. Um, again, so becoming familiar with your own care needs. Elliot Fukui has a beautiful um, two-hour training on um, how to build a care team focused on building care teams um, for and with disabled folks. Um, so I shared a quote from Elliot and also some of the guiding questions from Elliot in the zine. And then next slide is just being part of a care team as a relationship. And so um, always remembering, you know, that we have to just improve, putting a lot of time and energy towards improving the ways that we relate to others is how we build strong care teams, strong villages. Um, that means interrogating my internalized ableism, my adultism, um, and doing my healing work so that I can get in touch with my own feelings and needs and engage in generative conflict. Um, and so that is where I will leave you. Um, just consider how do we do our own internal work so that um, we can build better relationships so that we can build and sustain communities of care um, and it's ongoing learning. Uh, and with that, I think we will close and, and invite questions. Yeah, um, just wanna thank everybody for being here today um, and joining us. Wanna really encourage you to go through the zine. It's an excellent, excellent resource. Um, share it with other people in your communities. Maybe use the zine as a way to start a conversation with somebody you've been wanting to start a conversation with about these ideas. 
Think about um, using the resources that exist to open up new conversations, new ways of thinking. Share the podcast with somebody you want to have another conversation with. Maybe say, hey, when you get a chance as you're walking, going to the supermarket, running, maybe listen to this and let's let's chat. Let's talk about it later on. I also want to just say that um, I think we didn't explicitly bring this up. Uh, it, and, and Zara brought it up in passing, Queenie's crew will be sunsetting. Um, this is important because, um, because Project Nia is sunsetting. We are ending the work we've been doing for over 14 years now um, at the end of this year. And we will no longer be around. And so Queenie's crew will not be around. But Queenie's crew can be around if you all make your own Queenie's crews in your communities. Uh, this is the value of a million different experiments. It is also possible uh, if your organization wants to incubate a Queenie's Crew type space. I want to encourage you to reach out to Zara about that. Zara has so much incredible knowledge. You know, pay Zara to help you figure out how to make your next iteration of a your own version of a Queenie's Crew. I really think it's so, so important to do. Um, so yeah, so we will be no longer but this idea, these, these relationships will continue on and will develop into other things into the future. Yes, make print copies of the zine. Absolutely. There's a PDF about it. I'll put a link to a place that I use that's very, that's an online place where you can create uh, print zines at a good uh, cost for color copies. I'll put a link to that in the chat. I encourage you to print that out through that company. Uh, and again, I don't, I'm not a spokesperson for them or anything. I just make a lot of my zines there and usually much more affordable than any other place that I can find. So print the zine, share it with your communities. Absolutely. Share it with the Cop City folks. Yes. I love it. I love it. We're, we're hundred percent pro stopping Cop City. So, um, so yes. So thank you to all of you for that. But we do want to say like, while this experiment is going to shut down, it doesn't mean that new experiments shouldn't come into being. And it also doesn't mean that um, I think, you know, you'd be lucky anybody to uh, hire Zara to help figure out what to do with the new iterations of the things you may create in your own communities or in your own organizations. Um, so if there are any other questions um, that you want to put into the uh, chat, uh, please feel free to do that. questions or comments that you have, other resources that you would like to share with folks because you think it's important for people to know about those resources, put them all in the chat where um, I think uh, either Aaron or, or Eva is probably keeping track of those and we'll, we'll, we'll make sure we upload that to the site that we shared with you where everything was going to be at. Um, and I'm going to make sure I, I put the, the organization, I mean, the uh, place where you can um, order zines or pamphlets at cost. Here is that place. Yes, we say pay Zara, absolutely. We're, we're all for that. We're all for that for expertise. Questions that people have? I love to end early. <laughs> so if you don't have any questions or other things to share, um, we would love to invite everybody to go and enjoy the rest of your evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I just wanna say again, I'm so, so grateful to Zara for saying yes to me. You know, my friends and comrades surprisingly don't uh, shut off their phones when they see me calling or pretend they didn't get my emails. <laughs> and it is always to their everlasting grief at some point. Like, why did I say yes to this? It's so much work. But I just feel so, I'm just so lucky uh, to be in community with some of the best people. And uh, folks are always willing to jump in, uh, willing to try things out. And um I'm so happy to get to, to try things out with so many wonderful people over time. So thank you all for joining us today. We are so glad that you came. Thank you to everybody who made contributions to the zine. And thank you to everybody who's part of Queenie's crew, by the way, your kids and yourselves. Just wonderful.
And I would just like to echo that gratitude. Thank you all so much for joining tonight, for participating, for sharing um, so much today about the actions you're taking in your own communities to build communities of care. Um, it is heartwarming and uh, I'm just endlessly grateful. Awesome. And thank you to our ASL folks today for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you, Corbin, for live captioning. Thank you, um, Laura, for the graphic notes you're going to be making for us. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for holding down tech and getting all the stuff together on the back end. And Eva, for your partnership and the beautiful zine. So gratitude, gratitude, gratitude. It really does take a village. It takes a huge crew of folks to bring these things together. I'm so grateful. All right, everybody. Have a good night. I'll play some music to play us out. And uh, folks can go enjoy your nights. Thank you for being here. <laughs>